the button. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dyer Literary Series. And today, my feature and my guest is Chris Joseph, whose book, Life's Arrive, Life's A, I said Arrive, that's awesome. Life's A Ride documents his uh, journey from being diagnosed with a serious form of cancer to pretty much where he is right now, sitting in front of us. So uh, with that, we'll just turn it over to Chris. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining in. Um, I, I wanted to give you um, just a few seconds of background before I do a short reading. Um, in October 2016, I was diagnosed with uh, third stage pancreatic cancer, so four years ago this month. And you all know pancreatic cancer is, is, uh, doesn't have normally a good lifespan, not good outcomes. So about six months ago, eight months ago, I decided to write a book, um, which is here, Life is a Ride, um, to talk about my journey. And, and um, um, I think that's good for background. So I'm gonna do a short reading right now. A man who introduced himself as a radiologist entered the room where I had been nervously sitting and fidgeting impatiently for more than 30 minutes. With a solemn face and a seemingly sad voice, he said, sorry to give you the bad news. We found a mass in your pancreas. Whatever he told me after that, I didn't hear. It was as if someone had hit the mute button. All I could see was that he was still talking, but there wasn't any sound coming out of his mouth. He came unmuted at the end to say, talk to Dr. Moscow, you can go home now. A routine visit to get some medical tests had turned into a calamity. That day started as an innocent and typical Southern California sunny day, October 31st, Halloween day, 2016. I was 59, in less than two months, I would be turning 60. For all that October and the latter part of September, I had been experiencing some abdominal discomfort. I wasn't in any pain, so I figured it was a lingering stomach bug. It seemed to bother me more at night, which I was puzzled about, but didn't think much about it at the time. The discomfort was nagging me, but it certainly didn't scream to me that something was seriously wrong. So I decided in late October of that year to go visit my regular doctor, Dr. Moscow. For three or four months before that, I'd also been suffering from some major depression. And it was strange because my life was going really well. My work was thriving. My girlfriend, Susie and I had righted the ship after a hiccup in 2015, and my kids were doing well. I had no apparent reason to be depressed during this period, particularly this deeply despondent. For several weeks, there were many times I had contemplated ending my life. I couldn't figure out why I felt that way, and I was too depressed and too ashamed to tell anyone or to seek help. I made no connection between the depression or what I thought was a stomach virus. Anyway, I, October 28th, I visited Dr. Moscale. He ordered some blood work, pushed around my stomach, and then suggested I get some scans. Three days later, mid-afternoon of that Halloween day, I drove by, by myself to the imaging center in Santa Monica, not far from my house. I wasn't worried at all. I'd had many scans over the years, and I figured, like I said, that it was just a virus. After the ultrasound, my first test, I waited for the second test and waited and waited and waited longer than a normal wait. 30 to 40 minutes went by. Getting restless and impatient, I asked the front desk person what was going on. She went back and talked to someone and then came back and told me the first of many unforgettable things I heard that day. We need to contact your regular doctor because we want to run some additional tests that he didn't order. That wasn't good. I could feel my heart pounding immediately. Finally, the imaging staff ushered me in for whatever additional tests they wanted to run along, the CT, along with the CT scan I'd been waiting for. After those tests, they had me wait and wait and wait. Maybe another 30 minutes went by. It seemed like an eternity. I knew something was up and I remember texting my girlfriend Susie that I was really nervous. This was out of the realm of normal. 
Finally, the radiologist walked in with his sad face and bad news. And after hearing, quote, mass in your pancreas, unquote, and going deaf, I left. I departed not knowing much. I didn't know if it was cancer, although I assumed it was. I didn't know how big it was. I didn't know if it meant I had tumors elsewhere in my body. I didn't know how serious it was and I didn't know what to do. The only thing I knew was that they found this thing, a mass in my pancreas. I went into full bore panic and fear and it was fear I had never experienced before. I was having trouble breathing. I stepped into my car and started crying hysterically. It was about 3 p.m. that afternoon and I needed to get home to take my kids to their parties. My ex-wife, Carmen, was visiting her boyfriend in Australia, so I couldn't ask her to help with the kids. First, I called Susie. I was sobbing as I told her the news. Susie was stunned, I could tell. She didn't know what to say. What could she say? When most of us hear anything about pancreatic cancer, we think it's a death sentence. So much so that it's a go-to cancer screenwriters use when they want to write a character out of a show. I'd seen that story told on the screen way too many times. Why is it the cancer of choice for killing off a character? The five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is 10% according to the Pancreatic Cancer Network. I was obsessed with trying to figure out what I was gonna tell my kids. I couldn't stop crying, I was in such fear. I couldn't just fake it and act like nothing was going on. At the same time, I didn't want to scare them, so I decided just to give them an overview. But I also knew there was no way I was going to be able to keep it together in front of them. I walked into my house and the boys and I quickly gathered together. I told them what I knew, but I gave them an edited version. And I was sobbing when I told them. I held their hands and then they started crying. They saw and heard my pain and fear. I tried to reassure them that I thought everything was gonna be okay, even though I didn't believe it myself. I thought I was a goner. Telling my boys was the most difficult conversation of my life. My cancer adventure had begun. Thank you guys for listening to that. Thank you, Chris. and. Uh... That, that's really awesome and uh, very, uh, very brave of you to, uh, to do that. I, it's, uh, your journey is really amazing. And uh, so is the book. I've read the whole book. So I've got, which makes it really great for me when I've got to ask questions because I know what to ask. But um, we have a question though from someone else. Chris, did you find out if the depression prior to the diagnosis was related to the cancer? It was related to the cancer. Um... There's a correlation between some types of pancreatic cancer and depression, and depression is usually a warning sign that you have cancer. Um, I didn't know that until a few months into my journey, but yeah, there is a correlation. Now, what I like about the book is <clears throat> you your treatment was not, um, you know, your treatment was not. Um, I forgot to remove the spotlight. Sorry. Your treatment was not um, your typical cancer treatment. You know, I know that it started out that way, but you <clears> went <throat> to Germany, you did a crowd surfing. But I guess what I'm trying to get to is your book's not about basically this way that you got treated to like sell it or to promote it. Now, why did you decide to go in that direction? Um, I'd started out immediately after I was diagnosed with, with chemotherapy and I was just doing what the doctor told me to do, um, which I think most of us do, um, especially when you get a diagnosis of cancer. In my case, the chemotherapy was not working. My cancer was getting worse. And chemotherapy, if for any of you have had it, or you probably, if you haven't, you know people who have had it, it's tough. Chemotherapy is really tough. And so between it not helping and chemotherapy killing my body, I just decided in March of 2017 to quit. And I had no plan B at that point. It was looking back on it. I mean, it, it now I can say it was the best decision I ever made. But when I made that decision, it was more 
well, okay, if I'm going to die, I'd rather die of cancer than die of chemo. Um, but that day turned out to be great because it opened up all these possibilities of, of both Western medicine and non-Western medicine that I embarked on, which led me into being a four-year survivor that I am today. Do you have any anger or bitterness toward um, uh, the way you were treated initially or? Uh... You know, I'd love to tell you that I'm evolved, uh, that I don't have any. Um, but the reality is I, I still have some, not a lot, but um, towards my first doctor, I mean, he misdiagnosed me, which is too long of a story to talk about now. I, I mean, he didn't mis misdiagnose me that I had pancreatic cancer, but it was the type of pancreatic cancer that he missed. Um, he did not talk to me about any alternatives. He did not talk to me about, about nutrition. He didn't talk to me about moving my body. He was a very, he was a one trick pony and his, his one trick pony technique did help some people, but it also hurt some people and I'm sure it killed some people as well. Um, uh, I, I, by the way, I just wanna be clear, I'm not both in my book and here, I'm not here to promote or be against chemotherapy or radiation or, I, like I said, I did some Western medicine that helped me too. But, so to be so to be honest, totally honest about it. Say that I say that my son gets pancreatic cancer, or mm -hmm. I have pan, and I'm looking for advice. I say, Chris, what do I do? What's your gut reaction? My because well, I do, do get asked that a lot, um, and, I, and the first thing I tell people is I don't give any medical advice, but but and and I stick to that. But what I do tell people is I tell them my story. And it took me a while to realize that my story offered hope, which for people with pancreatic cancer, they're looking for hope. Then I also talked to them about taking charge of your body, taking charge of your healthcare, um, not being shy about asking questions, not being shy about getting, about getting second opinions, third opinions. Um, I, I tell people, especially for men who are going through this, that, I mean, I, part of my book, there's a chapter in my book about how I cry every day and I still cry almost every day. Um, and I'm, I'm convinced that it helped me. I'm did writing the book help you? Was it a cathartic experience for you or did, was it, it painful in a way? Both, it, it was both. It was cathartic, but you know, I mean, you know, you've written many books that you write the book and then you have to do your own edits three or four times. And then you have to submit it. In my case, I had four editors. And so I was going over the book so many times that it was, it was both, it was cathartic and very difficult. I mean, as you saw, just even reading the first chapter, part of the first chapter, when I think about telling my, my kids, it still gets to me. Now, besides medicine and treatment, how did you get through this? <clears throat> I'm still getting through it, even though I'm doing great. Um, I think this is a lifelong process, but, um, I try to move my body every day, a couple hours a day, whether it's yoga or Pilates or swimming or walking. Um, I eat better than I used to. Um, I take some supplements. Um, I'm not doing any kind of cancer treatment right now. Uh, and I haven't for the last year and a half almost. Um, I try to connect with my kids, try to connect with my girlfriend. I try to be honest, you know, I'm. I'm, you know, we're all works in progress and, and I'm just trying to connect with people more. There was a part in your book that I was thinking of with your girlfriend. You just have these conversations, almost these like jokes and this banter, like we're going to make cancer fun. Right. Um, <laughs> you guys pull it off or? Oh yeah, we, we both have dark senses of humor. So yeah, we, we pulled that off and we still, yeah, I mean, we, we make up disease names, um, you know, before I got diagnosed with cancer, we used to make jokes about cancer. Like, you know, if one of us would have a headache, the other person would say, oh, you know, don't worry, it's just a small tumor in your, in your brain. I mean, yeah, I mean, sick stuff like that. And, you know, the, ultimately the joke turned out to be on me since I got cancer. But um, yeah, we still laugh about it. I think, I think laughter is a big component, laughter and crying. Now, after what you've been through, how has your outlook of life changed? Are you a different person? Are you just the same person that's in remission or? 
when I was, I, I get asked that a lot. And, and when I was asked that early on, I would say in the first couple of years, my answer was, I, I don't really think there's been much change. But I would say in the last couple of years, there has been a lot of change. I think I'm more grateful. Um, I think I take less for granted. I think I go for things quicker than I used to. I mean, I've always been that way anyway, but you know, when I decided to write the book back in March of this year, I just, I barreled into it. I knew I was gonna do it. Um, but you also think, I mean, part of what was going on in my brain is because even though I'm doing great, I mean, my health truly is great, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna be great tomorrow, which is true for any of us here. So I, I also wrote the book with that in mind thinking, well, I don't know if I'm gonna be around tomorrow. So let's get this done. And so I think that, I think the cancer diagnosis has changed me that way too. Do things I wanna do. When you were blogging about it, did you have any idea that that was going to become a book? No, none, none. I didn't really start thinking about it until January of this year. I've been getting asked by so many people um, about my story. And I realized, wow, this is a pretty good story. And so that's when I decided to write the book. All right, we're gonna ask Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden, what is your experience with health insurance? If not good, how would you improve it? Wow, that, that is a great question, John. Um, <laughs> and, and I would say that I think my answer isn't the typical answer. I mean, I'm very liberal in my politics. Um, but I'm not going to answer with a liberal response. Um, I think the United States misses a lot when it comes to our healthcare because it's a it's a treatment of symptoms and treatment. It's it's not prevention. It's not wellness. And I think if we focused more on that, if we focused more on what we're eating, if we focus more on what are, we're, what we're putting in our bodies moving our bodies that would be so much better off. Um, so I do think the healthcare system can be improved a lot. Your question was, was my experience good? Um, mixed, mixed. Um, I mean, it was good, it was great that most of the stuff was paid for. So that part of it was good, except that when I went to Germany and did some alternative stuff and some alternative stuff I didn't, I, that I did here, that wasn't paid for. But I, I just think we can do better. I really do. I think we can do better. Were you surprised how you were able to raise, or your friends were able to raise that much money for you to go to Germany for that amount of time for, to get the treatment, which wasn't covered by your insurance and to have the success with it? Yeah, I was grateful and shocked and surprised. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for those of you who haven't read the book, um, my friends and family raised, I can't remember the exact number, but over $60,000 in about 30 days to help me help pay for my trip to Germany. And it allowed me to fly some people over so I wouldn't be there alone. Uh, my girlfriend couldn't go with me because she has a kid that she had to take care of. But um, yeah, I was, I was greatly surprised. And I, I mean, I, and that's another thing that I still feel very grateful for. All right, so before you wrote this book, you were a music writer and jazz magazine. Was that Offbeat magazine or? Um, no, I, I have, music is my hobby not playing music, but helping musicians in New Orleans. Um, no, I, I, I'm a uh, environmental consultant and have been for 35 years here in Los Angeles. I, I help real estate developers. Um, so, the, the, the music stuff was a sideline that came about after Katrina. Yeah, I saw an article written by Brett Milano, who's a Massachusetts guy who I know, right. who I actually read at the Live Dyer series in like 2005. So, oh, wow. You know Brett pretty well? I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, I don't know him super well, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we correspond occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. He's a super nice guy. I remember his first book was about uh, vinyl records, and uh, which was really, really an amazing book. Um, That's a small world. Yeah. Um, so... Linda would like to know about the specialists. Um, were the specialists that special? Were they that much better than the original doctor? Um, boy, another, these are great questions. Um, my original doctor was an oncologist, but he wasn't very good with me. Um, 
the second, I've only had two oncologists. The second oncologist I had was much better. Um, so that was great. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question beyond that. I really didn't have any specialists beyond the two oncologists. Um, the the, the non-Western medicine treatment I was doing here and in Germany were, they were more general doctors, um, naturopaths, um, osteopaths. We have a question from John. John said he was honored and privileged to be uh, with you through the writing of this book. And there are times that were extremely hard for you to revisit in parts of your story. Yeah. So what has been the challenges with writing a book, promoting it? And what advice would you give to especially first time book writers to help others on their own writing? Yeah, that's a great question, John. Um, you know, I'm learning on the fly. Um, so I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer this. I'm having a great time promoting it um, and sharing my story and talking to people and connecting with people. I've been doing, this is probably about the eighth, I call this a podcast. I don't know if it's a podcast or not, but um, just put it under the umbrella of podcasts. Uh, I've done about eight of these already. Uh, I, I did a bookstore uh, thing with uh, Garden District Books last week in New Orleans. Um, you know, I, I, what I, the biggest thing I've learned, I'm, tr I'm trying to think on the fly, John, the biggest thing I've learned is no one's going to market it better than the writer is. No one is going to do it. Um, I didn't have a traditional publisher. I used an a indie publisher and she was great. Her team were, were great when it came to editing amazing job editing and also getting the book on all the book platforms, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, but I didn't pay them for marketing. <clears throat> and so I pretty much am doing it all myself. So I devote, I'm devoting about a couple hours every day to doing some sort of marketing. All right. And uh, one thing we do at this Dire, Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series is we like to promote indie bookstores because they're kind of suffering right now. And uh, here's where, uh, Chris read at in its garden, its garden district bookshop in New Orleans. And it's amazing when I go to their webpage, Chris's book happens to be right there. So, um, you know, Chris has raised a lot of money for his treatment, but here his book is 1295, which is super easy and uh, to raise. And it's a great book. I recommend it. And it's uh, basically it's covers everything that we've talked about today, but it will go further into it. And it's a really, it's a wonderful journey and it's very, uh, uplifting thank so, you uh, i always figure out there we go and uh, i guess we have one last question do you have any tips on finding the best doctors i mean when you i guess do you when you had plan b were you googling were you like and then like do you feel you were lucky or was it how much research were you doing with this um i was doing a lot more research after after i thought i was going to die after the chemo was killing me um, I didn't do any research for the first oncologist at all. And that was a huge mistake. So I definitely think doing your research, I mean, believe it or not, some doctors have are reviewed on Yelp. Now Yelp isn't necessarily 100% re reliable, but you can get a good idea. Um, if you're talking about cancer diagnoses, you can call the, there's always local chapters of uh, cancer organizations. You can ask them for recommendations. I think the biggest thing though is talking to them. And if they're willing to sit down with you and listen to you and answer your questions and be open-minded, I think that to me, that's for me, that's the best thing that I could recommend. Um, I, I don't like top-down management. I don't like when someone tells me this is what you have to do and don't question me about it which is kind of what my first doctor was, not kind of, that's what he was like. All right, well, um, I would like to unmute everyone. They can, uh, they can uh, show their appreciation, which is awesome. Mm, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Cause I know you got a Dodger game to watch, a big Dodger fan and you know, hated what the Red Sox did to you guys a couple of years ago, but we're rooting for you. We really are rooting for the Dodgers. <laughs> Here's the good. Here's the good news. You gave us Mookie Betts for almost nothing. So yeah, that was a bad. Uh, that was a bad deal. So. <laughs>
<laughs> Guys, thank you so much. I'm going to stay on for a few more minutes until five my time. Um, okay. Thank you, guys. I'm going to shut. I'm going. I'm going to uh, shut off the live feed on Facebook. Whoever was watching there, if you want to participate in the open mic, log on to the Zoom link, and we've got room for you. But if you just wanted to watch and hear about Chris and hear about his book, thank you for tuning in. I'm Tim Gager, and this is the crew. Chris Joseph, thank you very much. Thank you. Great.